Okay, looks like a couple more people are logging in. But it is just about 530 here, so I will go ahead and get started and introduce our webinar while more people join us. So aloha everyone and welcome to a special presentation tonight with Paul Sturm and John Astilla sharing with us nature based solutions to cesspools and injection wells. We're all very excited that you're here. I'm Jill Wirt, your MC, a project manager at Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean Speaker series, usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is celebrating 14 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish. This monthly series is supported by the County of Maui Office of Climate Change, Resiliency, and Sustainability. A few things before we get going. You'll notice that your microphone is on mute. Please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid any distractions. We invite you to submit any questions by using the questions button on the lower edge of your screen. We'll leave time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. And now it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our presenters. Paul Sturm is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit organization Ridge to Reefs. Founded in 2011, Ridge to Reefs works to protect and restore coastal and coral reef ecosystems by reducing land to sea pollution with nature based solutions. His expertise includes treating polluted storm and wastewater by establishing green infrastructure solutions such as constructed wetlands, rain gardens, and bioreactors. Ridge to Reefs currently has, a proje has projects in the Chesapeake Bay, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Palau, and American Samoa. Paul has spent over 25 years working on watershed plans, implementation projects, sustainable agriculture, and code changes in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and around the country. Early in his career, he spent six years researching the effectiveness of implementation of agricultural and urban best management practices and developed methods to track and target pollution source areas in agricultural watersheds. John Estilla is the owner of Sunshine Vetiver Solutions in Kihei, a local business that produces vetiver grass and provides planning services for vetiver projects. He was introduced to vetiver while working as a conservation specialist for the Maui Soil and Water Conservation District at the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Science Kahului Field Office. John is certified through the Vetiver Network International as a quality producer of vetiver grass and has utilized vetiver throughout Maui to reduce erosion, manage water flow, stabilize steep slopes, and trap sediment. So from here, I will let Paul and John take it away. Thank you both so much for being here. We're so excited to learn about everything that you have been working on. Um, thank you again. Paul and John, I'll have you take it away. Sure, this is Paul. Um, I'm going to start my slides now. And let's see. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody can see that. <clears throat> Jill, can everybody see that? I don't see screens, or I don't see your screen being shared. Hmm. Okay, let me see. Let me escape. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. Let's see. Or not. <laughs> okay, how about now? Looks great. Okay. Great. Um, so my, my name is Paul Sturm. I'm the executive director of Ridge to Reefs. And I guess um, Ridge to Reefs has been doing work in Maui for about um, six years now. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about two different projects. One project um, is an alternative to um, continuing to inject the wastewater or partially treated wastewater into the injection wells. And so, as you can see from this picture right here, this is a project that John and I have worked on um, near the Kihei wastewater treatment plant. 
and essentially it's a um, we're using vetiver grass um, to um, uptake that water and uptake those nutrients uh, that are coming uh, from the wastewater and hold that in vegetation and also grow vegetation that's used for restoration projects around the island. Um, so that's one aspect. And then we're also going to talk about a, a similar kind of nature-based wastewater solution for um, the existing cesspool problem in, in Maui and across Hawaii. We all know there's 88, over 88,000 cesspools uh, across Hawaii that are, that are uh, contaminating the groundwater and that groundwater is then going out to the streams and rivers, as well as going out to the coral reefs and the swimming beaches um, and causing problems. So just a little background on my organization, Ridge to Reefs. We're a nonprofit organization. We were started uh, back in 2011. Um, and we work on nature-based systems uh, for on-site and community systems like wastewater systems uh, we work on safe, low-cost um, treatment projects. Uh, it, the idea of disposal and reuse of wastewater um, so that we can avoid uh, putting this water into injection wells that are just sort of a pipeline into the groundwater, which we all know ends up within, um, you know, a few days to a month, it ends up very often in our nearshore waters and uh, causes problems for our coral reefs. Um, and really, our, our, our idea is to, to provide a functional and quick to implement alternative to injection wells. And the great thing about nature-based solutions is that they're relatively low cost to implement. If we had to implement a similar project at a wastewater plant and provide this level of treatment, we would be looking at, uh, you know, the county has come up with projections, 20 or $30 million that, would, that uh, it would cost. Whereas these types of solutions are much lower, I would say uh, one fifth um, or more or, or less of the cost of um, those type of more expensive um, uh, solutions. Um, and we're really focused on circular economies and the reuse of things like waste materials to provide high levels of treatment. So what I mean by that, and, and I'll show some examples are reusing or, um, things like wood chips that are coming from invasive species. Um, we're, we're also, um, looks like we have an award from Maui County to look at glass recycling into sand. And then we're gonna use that sand, that glass sand as part of the treatment process. And, and so that's another example, taking things from the waste stream and actually creating really effective treatment systems. Um, and so certainly protecting our, our groundwater, coastal waters, coral reef health um, are all things that um, we're looking to do. And by reusing materials that people see as waste streams, um, we can lower the cost of on-site disposal systems for homeowners and the general public. And that's really one of our goals too, because the only way these things are gonna get implemented more quickly um, is if we can keep the cost low. Um, so real quickly, um, you know, some of the staff that's, uh, some of my staff that's working on this project um, include Fal Mantha, the Director of Agriculture and Sustainability. Um, Kelly Harris is a project, project engineer. Um, Albert McCullough is an engineer that we've worked with, I've worked with personally for over 25 years. Um, and he started his career early on um, in Lanai building a treatment wetland system for the wastewater in Lanai, so. And just a little more about some of the work that Ridge to Reefs does. Uh, you can see, um, you know, agricultural reuse of treated wastewater is, is something that we're focused on. Um, either growing um, restoration type of plants like vetiver or even integrating things like uh, potentially breadfruit, um, other tree crops, um, are another um, good idea that we'd like to see. And hopefully we'll be working on that with, um, with a number of other nonprofits and for-profits for in the Ma'alaya project as we're part of that as well. Um, and then you can see this reducing sediment from old agricultural lands. We've done a lot of work in West Maui, um, working on 
uh, trapping sediment, using nature-based practices to trap sediment, um, essentially living sediment traps. Um, it, uh, some of the sediment coming off the old dirt roads, um, coming off old agricultural lands. Um, and then down the bottom, you can see uh, this is a, um, a project that's for a 27 room hotel and we're using nature-based systems for wastewater treatment. And then the, the one that's more toward the middle is a, is a project that we worked on with University of Hawaii uh, where they were testing our nature-based system for alternative treatment systems for cesspools. Um, so for cesspool conversions essentially. Um, and then you can see the picture on the right. We also build things like constructed wetlands, um, wetland systems in agricultural areas, um, as well as even for wastewater. And other things we work on too are things like sustainable agriculture. And you can see uh, different types of compost and other things that we work on as well. <clears throat> so some of the major issues related to wastewater um, of course, 88,000 cesspools is very serious. Um, there's over 20 million gallons a day of secondary treated wastewater being injected into the ground and impacting the groundwater and reefs. There's really no clear path forward on a funding mechanism for the conversion of these cesspools by 2050 as mandated by Act 125. Um, there's also no clear path um, to really dealing with a lot of these injection wells um, and certainly there's no clear, like affordable solution um, out there either. Um, and certainly with volcanic geology and soil ca characteristics, there's a lot of challenges in terms of managing wastewater in Hawaii in general. So again, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this uh, kind of solution, nature-based solution that we've developed. Um, and we're really just, um, thinking about how mother nature treats waste and wastewater and the conversion of some of these pollutants to things that are, um, you know, like N2 gas makes up 80% 80, 80 of the atmosphere. So we're es essentially converting um, nitrogen into N2 gas. And we're also using the plants to help uptake that nitrogen and other contaminants um, such as pharmaceutical byproducts and other things that are in our wastewater. So again, I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about this system and this, we had to build this system above ground because we we're building at a wastewater plant, but it essentially, this is what a three, the system would look like for a three bedroom home. And of course this would be in the ground here, um, but essentially, um, you know, we have a liner here um, essentially, it's about a six by 14 area, and it's basically a garden with, with a lot of native plants. You can see um, some of the native um, hibiscus um, plants here, as well as the vetiver grass, which is kind of a workhorse, and it's also a sterile cultivar, so there's no real risk of vetiver spreading, um, and there's no history of that in the 40 years um, that has been used in Hawaii. Um, and we're also talking about trying to do a system that's solely with native species. Uh, and we think we can get similar performance um, as well. And on the lower right of this slide, um, you can see this is uh, a plot that we did near the Kihei wastewater plant. Um, and this is the vetiver grass growing. And we're taking that water that would be injected and we're applying it to the land with both drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation um, to essentially absorb all that water so that um, it doesn't contaminate the groundwater and contaminate the reefs. So again, this is, um, this is kind of how that project looked in the very beginning. Um, and this is the, sep the septic system um, that needs to be part of the system and that's, would be below ground, of course. And then, you know, the garden would be like a normal garden that you would have at your house. And there might be one sort of um, uh, four by six around that to keep water from running into that from, you know, like stormwater runoff um, kind of thing. And um, University of Hawaii measured this system or, or tested this system for six months. Um, and we had, you know, very high removal rates um, and it was, was very successful 
So the process um, is we sort of, the top part of the system uh, is aerobic. So uh, meaning there's, there's plenty of air in that system um, versus the system in the bottom is composed of wood chips. Um, and we keep that sub, those wood chips submerged and basically we create, um, we create habitat for bacteria that naturally denitrify water. And nitrogen is one of the most serious pollutants uh, in our coastal um, areas and really sort of the bane of the existence of coral reefs. Um, so again, that's one of our main focuses on really reducing and managing uh, that, that nitrogen. And so the first part, the, the aerobic portion is converting the, um, the ammonia, which is in urine and which is in our waste, uh, converting that to nitrate. Um, and then the, the bottom half of the practice is converting that nitrate to N2 gas um, and essentially um, putting it back in the atmosphere. <clears throat> And then we're also getting a lot of evapotranspiration from the plants um, that are uptaking those pollutants and they're also uptaking water. Um, and we esti estimated about a hundred gallons a day of evapotranspiration that we were getting from that system. So the amount of water lost or the amount of um, effluent lost to the environment is much less. Um, probably an average three bedroom home probably only uses two or 300 gallons a day. Um, so we're able to seriously reduce the amount of pollution that's actually getting into the groundwater. Um, so this is um, just some of the data um, and we were able to hire a graduate student um, to work on that and they're getting their thesis, um, you know, as part of this project. And so we had 87% removal of total nitrogen, 80 per, I think around 83% removal of phosphorus. Um, 15 to 20 percent volume reduction and 95 percent total suspended sediment removal. And it meets both the NSF 40 and NS, NSF 245. Those are international standards for water quality and nitrogen removal. And so those are some of the higher numbers really in the industry um, for, uh, for those types of uh, for these types of systems that are removing a higher level of pollution. Um, so some of the benefits are we use native plants. And so these are, you know, great for pollinators and bees. Um, we also used wood chips uh, that were recycled from invasive species. Um, this system sequesters carbon and it doesn't use any external energy source. So, you know, in some ways this offsets um, a household's carbon footprint, uh, which we all know is important to reduce the impacts of climate change. Um, and it creates circular economies. Um, the other types of systems that people uh, or that are comparable to this um, cost at least $10,000 more than this system. And um, they don't create circular economies where, you know, we're paying someone for the wood chips, we're paying someone for um, either glass sand or uh, local aggr aggregate uh, made from local materials. Um, and then we're paying a native plant nursery for a lot of the plants and we're, we're paying um, for the vetiver grass um, from folks that are growing vetiver grass. So it, it really creates more of a circular economy than a system that's shipped in uh, with a bunch of engineering um, pieces and plastic and other things that, um, that are being used. And this just shows one of the reasons why we like to use vetiver grass, it's kind of like the energizer bunny of, of grasses. And this is over, you know, one year, 360 days. And basically it just puts, keeps putting on biomass, both above the ground and below the ground. So it keeps growing that root system. It keeps growing those blades of grass. Um, and most other grasses all have cessation periods. So that means they stop growing for a while and then they start back up and you can see, see that uh, in this data, whereas the vetiver energizer bunny just keeps, keeps on going. And so again, these are things that happen in nature where water uh, moves from maybe a pollution source 
um, you know, something like corn is being grown and there's some loss of nutrients when that happens. And then as it's making its way to a stream, um, very often you have hydric soils or wet soils or a wetland and you have um, the breakdown of those pollutants. You have denitrification happening um, and that sort of thing. But what we're doing is we're kind of taking that same thing and we're doing it in a small, much smaller space um, and we're able to sort of measure um, what's coming in and what's going out. And you can see to the left here, that is an ATU system, which is an aerobic treatment unit. And so this is how an engineer would do this, um, would create these same or some of these same processes. Um, and not all engineers, but you can see there's alarm switches and electrical controls and there's pumps and there are stirrers and there are all kinds of things that, that are happening. And we're just using mother nature as a guide and we're creating, we're doing the same thing, but we're just doing it with, um, it just mimicking how, how nature does it. Um, so I just wanted to show just a couple other projects. This was a project we did at a 27 room hotel and restaurant about five years ago in Puerto Rico. Um, and it's likely their septic system was overflowing into Guanica Bay for the last 50 years. Um, and we noticed this and some of the people from the community said, hey, we think there's a problem over here. And then we did a bunch of sampling and we found like that there was a pipe that was surcharging. Um, I guess when the system got overloaded, um, essentially it surcharged into the, 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 uh, the bay right there. And so we built a system that could handle um, 6,000 gallons a day of wastewater. And you can see we excavated this area, we lined it, and then we started putting wood chips and biochar um, and creating a system, uh, essentially a nature-based system. And you can see this is right after planting. Um, and then this is a couple months later, you can see how, how much that grass has grown. And this is a couple months after that. Um, and we, again, we used a native hibiscus and you can see some of those, those flowers there. Um, let's see, just another shot. And now the, the hotel really sees this as an amenity. So they took something that was polluting the environment and actually we were able to create an amenity out of it. Um, so this is kind of the treatment system and then we have this area here where it's um, soaking into the ground um, with this vetiver grass. So, um, but what we've noticed is that this doesn't even discharge um, during normal conditions. So like say you have a normal week at the hotel, certainly maybe the summertime and holidays, you do have some effluent going into sort of cleaned effluent going into the ground here um, and being absorbed into the groundwater. But on a lot of days, there's no discharge because this, this grass and this um, nature-based system is so thirsty, essentially. So, so um, just wanted to make, um, you know, show an example. We're talking about using a system like this, um, but a much larger system we've built these to handle um, 250, or 250 to 300,000 gallons a day, you know, a much larger system, but we built those on farms, uh, including on the Eastern shore of Maryland and, and also in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, uh, associated with um, large springs that are contaminated with nitrogen. Um, so one of the ideas we have for some place like West Maui, where injection wells are being used right here on site, and then that water is showing up, you know, about a month later in all these coral reefs here um, with high nutrients and causing uh, potential problems with the reefs there. And those, those reefs have been on decline, um, as have the ones in Kihei very significantly um, over the past 20 or 30 years. So the idea would be to have some of these systems treat that water um, and then the water, the effluent from that water could be pumped up the hill to, um, this is Kanapali Coffee Farm, 
um, who really needs the water for growing the coffee. And so, you know, that's one of the ideas that we have that we can use these lower cost nature-based solutions to provide high quality, clean water to farmers um, and others that are growing, um, growing crops that, that help to support us. So um, just real quick, this is also a system that we built, a similar small system. This was just for a pre-K kindergarten class um, at that, a building that they had added. This is in American Samoa at a small elementary school. And they were building this um, septic system here. And they were essentially going to just let it leach out um, from that septic system right into the adjacent soil, which was all coral stone and sand. So that meant that water was just going to go right into the groundwater because it was going to pass through that coral stone and that sand very quickly. Um, and you can see other places in that same village where there's a ton of algae growing on the rocks because that wastewater is making its way too quickly to the, net, to the, to the bay and to the ocean. So again, we kind of excavated a system, we lined it um, and just, just created a very simple treatment practice. Um, I think some of the things that we've done uh, with the University of Hawaii are much more thoughtful and um, much more where we're trying to convert ammonia um, so that it, to uh, nitrate so that we can treat that system to a much higher higher quality. But even these systems work very well and they have very little discharge um, because there's not a whole lot of usage necessarily from that pre-K class. So with that, I I I'm going to turn it over to John. And um, again, John had the idea to um, John had the idea to really think about vetiver grass as a potential treatment system for um, this R1 wastewater, and has been an advocate for the last ten years um, that that the county should um, try a system like this. And so, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John and thank him for um, presenting. Yeah, thanks, Paul, for the for the intro. Um, my name is John Estilla, and I'm just going to touch base on a project that we have going on in Kihei with um, recycled R1 water. Uh, when we started this project back in spring of 2021, um, you know, there was a study out that had recommended surface disposal for uh, recycled water, uh, and there was always this question that popped up, like, how much water can vetiver consume? So, you know, we jumped into this project um, with the idea of testing out that study and answering that question, like how much water can we dispose of with vetiver grass? And at the beginning of the project, you know, we anticipated roughly 20,000 gallons of wastewater per acre um, can be disposed of with vetiver. You know, after seven, several months of this project, we realized that that 20,000 number was actually um, a mid-range number and we actually improved on that and did way better. Next slide, please. So this is a test plot in Kihei. It's roughly 15,000 square feet. Um, it's uh, about 0.34 fourths of an acre. And uh, in the middle picture, in the picture to the right, that's vetiver grass. As you can see, it's a perennial bunch grass. It's sterile. Um, and because of its extensive root system, it makes it a ideally suited for um, treating wastewater. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the reasons, like I just stated, why we chose vetiver. It's fast growing, non-spreading and non-invasive. And even in highly saturated situations, the vetiver takes up a lot of, of water, so the high water use rate. Um, and because of those extensive roots, it also has the ability to absorb a high amount of pollutants, nitrogen, phosphorus, and actually has the ability to bind heavy metals within its root system. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is um, you know, another another inspiration for doing this project in Kihei was this project that was done in Australia where um, a field was irrigated with primary treated wastewater. Um, it's not as clean as the wastewater we're dealing with in Kihei, but as you can see um, during this pilot study, that nitrogen and phosphorus were reduced by 99 and 98% respectively, 
um, fecal coliform was also reduced. Uh, and one thing I want to point out in this slide is um, the volume. You know, so the inflow of this project had about 450 gallons per day, you know, 1,670 liters. And um, by the time the monitoring wells were checked on the back end of this project, it was almost nil. So just on that, that short amount of space and area, you know, the vetiver grass was able to successfully consume quite a bit of water without letting it discharge out of the system. Um, and it's hard to see with the, the print, but the, in yellow where it says almost nil, the system only had overflow during heavy rains, um, which is something that we experienced also in Kihei with our monitoring wells. Next slide, please. Okay, so just as a result, you know, as I said at the beginning, we were trying to show that we can dispose of, you know, 20,000 gallons of water. Um, that's a per acre rate, and we hit that rate within seven months. So at the start of the project, I was irrigating that 15,000 square feet with roughly 1,800 gallons of water per day, and gradually ramped up the irrigation uh, on a monthly basis. By the time we hit October, which was seven months into the, the planting, uh, we were irrigating a little over 7,000 gallons a day. And that application rate, as I stated, is roughly 20,000 gallons per acre per day. Um, by December, beginning of January, um, that figure increased. We were irrigating that 15,000 square foot test site with over 10,000 gallons of water a day, which is equivalent to 30,000 gallons per acre per day. Um, and it was pretty amazing. You know, we didn't see any runoff coming from the project site and even walking in between the rows. It was saturated, but not ponding and it wasn't mucky, um, but the ground was wet. So we know the vetiver was, you know, consuming a lot of that water. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a scale showing um, how we ramped up the water over the course of a year. Uh, so that application rate at the beginning was just under 10,000 gallons per acre per day. And through um, the end of December and January timeframe, we were closer to 32,000 gallons a day. And, you know, based on those results um, to treat the wastewater that's coming out of the South Kihei facility, um, which injects roughly 2 million gallons a day, we can uh, take that wastewater and irrigate roughly 60 acres successfully uh, with vetiver grass and, you know, shut those injection wells off. Next slide, please. Um, so here's some other benefits. Um, you know, our nature-based system, it's low cost and can be quickly implemented in the interim. You know, there's been a lot of interest in, in water, especially with drought conditions, and we're all for supporting um, any way to stop those injection wells. But we've tested the system over the last year and feel that this could be a, a low cost um, short term practice that can be implemented while longer term solutions are explored and tested. Uh, and this system actually works really well with other other proposed uses, you know, with it, whether it's like an ag or ranching scenario, vetiver can be easily incorporated to address, you know, any erosion issues, for instance, and we can create a, a system that feeds two birds with one seed, you know disposing or reusing that wastewater, as well as um, providing erosion control. And, you know, the cool thing with the vetiver grass system, we can easily scale it up. It's throttleable. Um, so when there's times that we don't have a lot of wastewater to dispose of, we can reduce the amount of water going to the vetiver. Uh, but if there is an excess of wastewater, we can take that, that excess as well and, and get rid of it. Uh, so as the community's demand for the R1 uh, increases, we can adjust the amount of vetiver that's being irrigated within the system or irrigated into the, the vetiver plot. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so th these are just some siting considerations. Um, you know, for instance, using the example of Kihei, with 60 acres, we can dispose of that 2 million gallons of wastewater a day. You know, that can be in a, a centralized disposal um, area where we irrigate 60 acres and operate it somewhat like a farm. Um, or the centralized um, system can be decentralized and you'll have, you know, a number of smaller scale sites that are along existing infrastructure and R1 lines. Um, this would allow us to really address erosion concerns 
um, and just decentralize the system because access to land has been a challenging, um, the challenging for us. So we feel that there's there's opportunity to you know decentralize the system and utilize bare land or you know even county or state land that's being um, planted with other um, vegetation that's not so high water use. Uh, we could use the vetiver grass in those situations and um, create disposal sites you know throughout the infrastructure line. Next slide. I um, mean, and some other benefits with using the vetiver grass. Um, vetiver is a great sequester of carbon. So to address some of those climate change goals through the county's um, climate change office, you know, this might be a possible alternative. Um, one acre of vetiver grass can sequester up to two or 22,000 pounds of carbon annually. Um, and for a, for a grass, it's really good. You know, and the, the good thing about that with vetiver, we can hit that peak sequestration amount relatively quickly as compared to like a, a grove of trees or you know, other, other vegetation. Um, we also found that through the, the last year of this pilot project that the vetiver is not palatable to, uh, to feral ungulates and deers. We've actually had some native plants that were planted in between the vetiver rows and even more recently potted plants that were placed in between the vetiver rows and um, the deer have not been able to get to it or they just haven't found interest in, in getting past the vetiver to get to the natives. So it's kind of a, a neat observation that we've been seeing. Um, you know, and that got us thinking that at maturity, this vetiver grass might actually be a great alternative for um, addressing feral deer and ungulates rather than spending that money on expensive fencing. Um, you can plant vetiver as a way to, to, to address that issue through a nature-based type solution. Next slide. I think that was it. Next slide, please. Yeah, that was it. So that was our project in Kihei. You know, I just you know want to thank Maui Nui Marine Resource Council and Paul for working with us on this project. And you know, thanks for everyone uh, for taking the time to come listen to us. I guess we can open it up for any questions at this point. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. We have time for questions, maybe fifteen minutes or so. So you can go ahead and use the Q&A box. I'll also pull up the chat if anything comes through there. Um, and then if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can go ahead and submit your question as a comment, and then it will be relayed to us here. So I do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. I'll just start with those. Have you tested the system in an area of high rainfall? How about for a slaughterhouse runoff effluent capture. So Paul, um, you want to answer that, Paul? I, I can answer a little bit about the, um, the slaughterhouse runoff. Um, typically in the slaughterhouse runoff, you're going to have a lot of blood that's mixed in with that wastewater. Um, and we haven't been able to test that yet. In other studies, vetiver has been used to treat slaughterhouse runoff. Um, you know, the one I guess drawback with using a nature-based solution for that is that the, the area needs to be fairly large because of that um, blood content in the water. Um, just from studies I've seen, it, it significantly increases the size of your disposal area. In terms of rainfall, I'll let Paul speak on that. Yeah, and, and um, so we, we've built similar systems in American Samoa for piggeries. So runoff from wet washdown piggeries and the systems have worked well. I think um, it's necessary to do uh, almost like a, a septic system before you, you um, send it to the vetiver grass um, because um, we want to remove the solids, either the solid waste essentially from the pigs um, because what would happen over time if we didn't do that, um, the system may start to clog with sediment uh, which is essentially from the manure from the pigs. So, so I would think a similar, and, and again, we see about 120 inches of rain a year um, in some of the areas that we work in in American Samoa. So these systems do work um, in th those, those areas as well. But we're also talking about for uh, wetter areas like Hana and other places like that in terms of the bioreactor garden, the, the alternative to cesspools, 
um, we would put a liner over this system and then cut small holes through it and plant the vetiver grass through those holes. So when you get a big, big deluge of water, um, then we're gonna allow the flow um, to go off to the side, you know, the rainfall to go off to the side. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's my answer for that. Yeah, and in any situation where there's heavy rainfall, there's definitely gonna be a lot of engineering work to um, identify safe, stable outlets for any runoff. So, you know, for those home systems, you know, if there is a homeowner interested in something like this for a wet, wetter area, um, we just ask that there's patience because we'd have to deal with Department of Health to ensure that, you know, the system won't overflow and cause more of a problem. Um, but it is definitely doable in, in wetter areas. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. We have a lot of questions coming in, so I'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, next one is how can an individual property owner in Maui County go about getting this implemented? Can your organization be hired? Are there any county rules, regulations, hoops to try and jump through? Um, so, so yes, the, the answer is yes to that. We're approved now by the Department of Health, um, particular for areas or the drier areas within islands. We're still trying to get... Um, you know, full permission for um, the wetter areas. So someplace like Honaside. Um, and again, what we're, what we've sent back to DOH is, okay, in these systems where it's wetter, um, we're going to put a liner on top of it and then plant vetiver grass through it. Um, these systems can even work without the vetiver grass. So, you know, we're off also sort of off offering that as a solution to um, DOH's um, concerns on that. But right now, so any place um, that has um, less than nine inches of rainfall in a 25 year storm, this system is approved as it is for any of those areas. So that would be any areas like in West Maui and Kihei, um, in Pukalani, um, you know, Makawao, those, those types of areas. When you get into some of the wetter areas, more going toward Hana, you know, we're still, um, you know, we're still waiting on approval for, but this is typical from what I understand of DOH. You know, I think we're, we have to kind of show them the burden of proof that yes, this system, we can keep rainfall off of this system if we need to. Um, but again, we've built this system in, we built a very similar system in American Samoa where it gets 120 inches of rainfall and the system's working very well. So we know it, it, it can and does work at higher um, rainfalls, but we are too concerned. We, we, you know, there's no reason to have all that rainfall going onto the practice. Um, so you know, we have made accommodations um, for that. Great. And we're actually looking for a pilot. Um, so you know, I think that we would be willing to contribute some of our own time and resources and materials to help put in a project. So we would be interested in, in even sharing the costs associated with that. So, um, you know, we have the ability to do at least one of those. Wonderful. Um, another question, I noticed the vetiver looked trimmed in many pictures. How easy is that and what happens to it after it's trimmed? Uh, it could be easy, especially with a hedge trimmer. Um, you could do it with sickles as well. The grass is fairly easy to cut. Um, and after you cut it, it it'll regrow. Um, the grass tends to develop a, a cut line where the vegetation starts to become stiffer at the site of where you cut it and it starts to grow back more supple from that, that point. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I recommend at least one, one pruning annually with the vetiver grass. Great. Is it, is the vetiver, sub is the vetiver susceptible to any pests or diseases? Um, no, you know, I've been growing vetiver grass since 2008. Um, it hasn't had any pests or diseases in this whole time I've been growing it. And what happens to the grass in the end or after a few years? Well, vetiver is a perennial bunch grass, so it just continues to grow. Um, there are records of vetiver planted in American Samoa that is over 150 years old, so it's pretty long-lived. 
Um, right now, the very first vetiver that was tested on Molokai that was planted in the early 80s, um, it's still alive and standing tall. Um, the last time I saw that hedge at the plant material center on Molokai, the hedge was a good 12 to 15 feet tall. Wow. Um, and that was, you know, 30 plus years since it had been planted when I had seen it. Yeah, and the other the other thing is that with the clippings, you could just put those in between the rows. You could use the clippings, um, you know, uh, as mulch for mm -hmm. other things, like for other plants, um, other native species, those sorts of things. It works really well as a mulch um, because it, it's a fairly stiff um, grass, so it's hard for things to grow through it, and it and it it works well as a mulch in general. Awesome. Yep, we when uh, we use vetiver and pohakea for our projects, we work with John, and um, we'll use some of the vetiver as mulch as well. I'm just leaving it there for more nutrients. Um, another uh, question, mahalo to Paul and John for your work and wonderful presentation. Do you have a cost estimate for converting a single family home system uh, cesspool system? So it, it, it's always hard to give estimates because um, we don't know how much rock will, you know, will be, you know, how much rock will have to be excavated. But it, it's a relatively, you know, again, it's a 14, six by 14 area that has to be excavated and it has to be excavated to about, um, to about three feet deep. Um, and so, um, you know, so, so, so there's certainly um there's excavation involved there's excavation involved for the septic system um but i would say that this system you know is about ten thousand dollars cheaper than a similar system like a, a, an aerobic treatment unit that would provide a similar level of treatment and this this system generally requires no energy as long as there's gravity flow to the system um but it's difficult to, and, and we're also trying to convince Department of Health that we can reduce the size of the leach field if we plant vetiver grass in the leach field. And we've proved that in other places. Um, so we're trying to get them to accept that because if they are willing to accept that, um, then we can almost create something that's akin to a zero discharge system because the vetiver will be uptaking all this water and all that effluent um, and there will be no discharge to the groundwater. There will be no contamination of the groundwater. And so um, we're certainly, um, you know, and so we're, we're really working on to reduce the costs. Um, and maybe they would let us do this at least in a pilot where maybe they'll let us do it in a pilot that we can have a vetiver leach field as well as, um, you know, the bioreactor garden system. Um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that we could really reduce the area. Our engineers have been doing some calculations in the first or in the last few days. And we're looking at like a, at least a 50% reduction in the size of the leach field. Um, in some cases, we're cutting the size of the leach field in half um, or even further, depending on the, the, the soil types. So um, certainly, it, you know, this, this is um, a solution that can save a lot, save money compared to similarly functioning systems. That's great. That's incredible. Um, the same person asked a follow-up question that they are curious about the maintenance requirements for the vetiver over time. So other than the pruning, what does that look like? That's just the, that's the bulk of the, the maintenance right there is um, just an annual pruning. If that um, there are some other projects where they haven't been pruned in, in years, um, but I like at least an annual pruning just helps stimulate new growth. Great. Um, and then in the chat, I was going to hop over here. Um, have you talked to Maui County about allowing this to be an acceptable and legal substitute for septic systems on residential properties? Um, I think most of our discussions have been with the Department of Health. I don't know, Paul, if you've been contacted or contacted the county. Yeah, most of our discussions have been with the Department of Health. 
Um, you still need a septic system. Um, it, you know, DOH's regulations, you still need a septic system, but this is a companion to the septic system that really, septic systems across the country um, really don't remove nitrogen. And what we've seen in places like Long Island and in Florida, that they've had harmful algal blooms um, in these areas and also, you know, certainly cause problems with coral reefs in Florida as well. And so really most of the country is, particularly in coastal areas, are moving away from septic systems and are moving to systems that also remove the nitrogen, which, which the system does. Um, so. Yeah, just closer to home, there was a study done on Big Island in Puoco where they actually found these DOH approved septic systems were still contributing quite a significant amount of pollutants to the near shore waters. Um, so with our bioreactor and, and, and vetiver leach field, you know, we're hoping to innovate the system to where it is zero discharge. Because ultimately that, that's that's the goal we're trying to get to, you know, is having no pollutants breach that that in the environment. Great. Um, are there any downsides or smells that come with these systems? No, I don't know. You know, the the pilot project we had on Oahu testing the home system. Um, you know, granted we were on a wastewater facility, but the system itself didn't have any odor. Um, yeah, this I, is I, primary I, treated. This isn't even, you know, like the wastewater treated by the plant. This is them screening sewage and we're getting the effluent from that. Yeah, and what we do is that we cover, we cover where the the effluent is coming out of the septic system. Um, we cover that with gravel and cover that with material. Um, and then the, also the vetiver grass is growing right in there as well. So the water moves, the effluent moves very rapidly into the system. And once it's, you know, at, it's, it's below ground pretty much when it comes out. So, um, so we really haven't um, noticed any smells associated with the, with the system. Um, and then once it's underground, it stays underground essentially. Um, Great. Um, and then Paul, I saw you're you typing an answer to a question um, about if the system would work in Alaska with the tundra. Well, these type of systems would work there, but it would not work with the vetiver grass. We would have to use native species to Alaska that are cold tolerant. Um, a vetiver is somewhat cold tolerant. It could be used in, so the Southern half of the United States, um, but I don't think it would work very well, um, you know, in Alaska. I think in those colder climates, um, the vetiver grass won't do very well. But I think there are a lot of cold season grasses um, in, um, you know, in the United States. So. I think there would be cold season grasses that could be used in this type of system. Um, again, um, this system doesn't even have to have vegetation in some place like Alaska um, because you can still get really high levels of treatment without the vegetation. The vegetation, one of the biggest things that it does, it reduces the volume of effluent um, by evapotranspiration. Um, and it also takes up some of those other contaminants like pharmaceuticals and other things. So. Great. So it is um, 624 and Paul, you're on the East Coast. So I want to be mindful of, of everyone's time here. Um, Paul and John, if you wouldn't mind putting or if you don't mind putting your contact information into the chat, because I know we still have some questions in the Q&A um, and I want to give people the opportunity to reach out to you to follow up with those. And then we'll um, get ready to close out here. So thank you both again so much for being here and um, providing so much of your expertise about these really great projects. Again, if you have additional questions, um, we're going to share some contact information and then feel free to follow up. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so it'll be available on um, Facebook Live as well as our YouTube page probably in the next week or so. 
So if you missed some of it, um, we also have our past presentations on there as well. Um, but again, thank you both so very much for giving your time and sharing. And thank you to our audience for being here tonight. This is Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Know Your Ocean Speaker Series, sponsored by the County of Maui Office of Climate Change, Resiliency, and Sustainability. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is a nonprofit celebrating 14 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. Our next Know Your Ocean Speaker Series event will take place on Wednesday, August 3rd at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. We'll be hosting Maria Harvey, Director and Chief Research Coordinator at Hawaii Uncharted Research Collective, where she'll be presenting on whale shark research. To hear about signing up for this talk and to learn about other future presentations, please sign up for a free subscription to our monthly e-newsletter, Reef and Brief at MauiReefs.org. Amazon Prime Day is July 12th and 13th. And when you shop with Amazon Smile, you'll find the exact same prices, selection, and shopping experiences as Amazon.com with the added benefit that Amazon Smile will donate half a percent of your eligible purchases to the charitable organization of your choice. We hope that you will choose Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. To use Amazon Smile, simply go to smile.amazon.com on your web browser or activate Amazon Smile in the Amazon Shopping app on your iOS or Android phone within the settings or programs and features menu. There is a new coastal water quality report that's available to download on huiokavaiola.com slash findings. This report summarizes coastal water quality findings at sites from Honolulu Bay to Papalaua and from Ma'alaya to Ahihi Kina'u Natural Area Reserve. Since 2016, Huioka Viola has collected and analyzed over 3,200 water quality samples from 48 sites and has found that these coastal waters are often degraded by land-based pollutants, including sediments, fertilizers, and wastewater. You can support continued water quality monitoring by adopting your favorite beach or by becoming a trained water quality sampling volunteer. This community-based water quality monitoring program launched and conducted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, the Nature Conservancy, and West Maui Ridge to Reefs Initiative in partnership with the State of Hawaii Department of Health Clean Water Branch tests ocean water quality at three weeks at every three weeks at 29 locations in South and West Maui. Visit huiokaviola.com for more information. When you donate to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, you'll also be supporting our work to improve the ocean water quality in Maalaya Bay. Our projects include our oyster bioremediation project, which has caged oysters in the bay filtering sediment and other pollutants out of the water. We're also stabilizing the slopes of Poakea watershed to prevent sediment runoff by planting vetiver grass, which is a non-spreading deep-rooted drought and fire-resistant plant that keeps soil from washing into the ocean during rainstorms. And so far, we've planted 2,300 vetiver plants. If you've missed some or all of tonight's presentation, again, you'll be able to view it on Facebook Live on our Maui Nui Marine Resource Council Facebook page, and it will also be posted on our YouTube channel, Maui Reefs. And last but not least, we want to thank all of our sponsors and supporters who are making our work possible. And we also wish to thank individual donors like you. Mahalo for making a difference. Thank you all again for joining us this evening. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you all next month on Wednesday, August 3rd. Aloha.